All right, so I'm back in the Fitz News studio for the Week in Review. After a two-week hiatus, I want to thank Dylan Nolan, our director of special projects, for filling in for me while I was gone. But I am back. I am tanned. I am rested. I am uh, refreshed, it smells like. Well, we got a lot of news to cover this week, folks. There's a big sex scandal in the South Carolina upstate, the heart of the Bible-thumping Palmetto political world. South Carolina Congressman William Timmons is neck deep in some serious drama, folks. And believe it or not, this is a sex scandal that does not involve me personally. So I'm very grateful for that. But we're going to dig into how, how it started, where it's going, uh, because this story is all the buzz, not only in the upstate, but just across South Carolina over the last week or so. William Timmons sex scandal. We're going to cover that from start to finish. There are also some developments in the Murdoch murders, crime and corruption saga, which could play a big role in this case, moving forward. I'm talking about a potential additional layer of evidence against Alec Murdoch, who is a person of interest in the homicide at Moselle, his family's hunting property, where his wife and son were found murdered about 13 months ago. We covered a very interesting angle to this case this week, and I want to get into that and its potential impact on this case moving forward. So we're going to talk about that too. Additionally, we're going to dip our hands into the feedback bag. We're going to talk to some of our readers. And on that front, we're going to have a whole segment about our open microphone policy, which is going to be increasingly important to Fitz News moving forward. It's something that I've been focused on for years, inviting different voices to the discourse on our news outlet. But we've got two amazing new voices on the site, one you know about and one you're going to learn a lot about in the weeks to come. Stay tuned for all that and much more on your Week in Review. It started with a whisper. There's a song about that, right? I think. Started with a whisper. Everybody Talks. That's the song. I know that song. Anyway, everybody talks in South Carolina politics. We know that. In fact, mostly they're talking to me. I hear a bunch of stuff, stuff I don't even want to hear half the time. But last week, as you know, I wasn't here. I was on vacation. I was down at North Litchfield with the family, minding my business, uh, received some information about U.S. Congressman William Timmons. Uh, now, William Timmons has represented the 4th Congressional District in South Carolina since 2019. He is a social conservative. Uh, he represents social conservatives. This is the evangelical, kind of heart of the Bible beaten South Carolina conservative upstate. So this is part of the state where if you're going to have an extramarital affair, you better keep it quiet because they actually will rat you out because it's viewed as hypocritical. Um Again, do I view it as hypocritical? I mean, if you follow this news outlet long enough, you know that we have a different take on the personal lives of politicians. In other words, we don't really care what they do in their personal life. I'm a libertarian, people. If you want to, you know, whatever you do, as long as kids, animals, and clown masks aren't involved, I'm pretty much okay with it. But in the Timmons case, something very interesting happened. We were provided this information. And as I often do, I'll reach out to folks who are in the orbit of the politician who's involved and say, hey, just FYI, we're hearing this. And I believe I have a due diligence to make sure there's no taxpayer component to any affair allegation, that there's no criminal activity, no pressuring, you know, people using sex as leverage for jobs and, and things of that nature. And so I do vet the information that comes in. But nine times out of 10, if it's just somebody having an affair, who cares, right? And most people know this. People who work for the politicians in South Carolina know this, so they know they don't really have to worry about us breaking some big story, particularly just on the basis of an initial rumor, right? Because rumors are everywhere, right? Everybody spreads rumors. But this was interesting. I submitted this information to one of the con congressman's aides and just said, hey, we're hearing this. Never said I needed a comment. Never said we were writing a story. In fact, our news team hadn't even really started discussing this. We literally just got the information. The response I got, stand by for a statement from the congressman. Wait, what? They issued a statement? I, get, I didn't ask for a statement, right? Somebody wanted this story out, folks. And I don't know why. I don't know what the motivation was, but that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Somebody wanted this story to come out. And it may be the person who's at the heart of the saga, Congressman William Thames. So we were issued an 18-word statement. This happened last Sunday. Basically, the congressman asked for prayers as he and his wife dealt with a difficult private matter. Well, it didn't take long for that difficult private matter 
to assume a name and a face. All right, so this is Paula Dyer. She is a socialite. She's an interior designer. She spends time jet-setting from Costa Rica to Charleston and from Greenville to the Hamptons. She's living large, people. Uh, and uh, by the way, our director of special projects, Dylan Nolan, he had a very special project spending about half an hour on her Instagram page the other day. Am I right, Dylan? You love that job, man. Dyer is, I don't know, man. Everyone seems to have a different take on her. She is hated by some. She's admired by others. She has built a business, uh, although we'll get to this in a minute. There's some dispute over who built the business that she and her husband have been running uh, for the last decade or so, flipping properties, uh, commercial and residential, uh, amassing a sizable fortune in that process, but not William Timmons' money. Now, before we go down the, the road of who Paula Dyer and her husband are, who, their business, their fortune, we need to talk a little bit about William Timmons' family. Now, William Timmons isn't just a congressman from the South Carolina upstate. He's a businessman. He's a fifth-generation uh, of a family in Greenville, South Carolina, that has literally defined the Chamber of Commerce, philanthropic. You know, they are upper crust people worth, I'm told, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, got their start back in the in the Depression, post World War One, uh, literally building that infrastructure for Greenville's business community. So, just a hugely influential family, hugely entrenched family up there. Uh, powerful, not just from a business standpoint, but also politically. And we're going to get to the political ramifications of this scandal here in a bit too. But So that's William Timmons. Massive fortune, uh, fortunate son. You know, We'll call him what he is, fortunate son, born with a silver spoon, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Paula Dyer and her husband, Ron Rollis, a little more of a worked for it kind of ethic, more of a built it from scratch, built it on their own. But, you know, there's a little privilege in the mix there. But how did this thing blow up? Well, we've got text messages that were provided to this news outlet that clearly showed a relationship between Timmons and Paula Dyer. And again, these weren't messages we planned on publishing. These, this wasn't information we planned on to go in public with prior to the congressman issuing his statement uh, in, in response to some of these rumors. But the messages clearly show a relationship. Now, how do you respond when your wife is caught in an affair with a sitting U.S. congressman? That's a question I, I hope I'll never have to answer that question. But <laughs> anyway, Ron Rallis' response has been off the chain. And I got to say, at first, I was kind of like, who is this guy jetting up to the Hamptons in his private plane, kind of looking a little douche canoe-ish? Uh, mm, at first, I was a little skeptical of the guy. Plus, you know, he was retweeting a little, a little trash talk to Fitz News, and I'm kind of like, all right, dude. But... The more I've followed this guy, and again, he's 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 crass, he's crude, uh, he's <laughs> profane, but the more I've kind of followed this guy, the more I've actually kind of li grown to like him. Uh, he is responding to this scandal just with a complete spasm of emotion, a, a spasm of 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 wit, of humor, of uh, I mean, it's just like nothing I've ever seen. In fact, I wanted to cut to one of the clips that we we did in a story this week, one of the follow-up stories. And this is in response to a message that Rallis received from Timmons' brother. And the message, I want, I want to put this message up here real quick. I'm not going to read this because you can see, I mean, who are these people? Look at this language, you know, S, my F, and cock. I mean, what, what is this? This is like Dylan's laughing behind the scenes over there. Uh, I, it's just not what you expect. It's, it's, I mean, who are these people? I, I guess this is what what the way you talk when you have hundreds of millions of dollars and you want to mock people for not having the money to join you in the Bahamas. But uh, anyway, so this is this is what was sent to him. Now, this I don't understand why this was was ever sent because Ron Rallis for the last week, literally anything anybody texts him, he has taken a screen capture of it and he is posting it publicly to his Instagram page. So he's literally live streaming uh, his his wife's. Uh, affair with the congressman uh, on social media. But anyway, William Timmons' uh, brother decided to send him this nasty message, and here is his response. And no, I didn't know about all this stuff. I didn't know about any of this stuff. I'm a, I'm an easygoing, fun-loving, supportive husband. And, and oh, yeah, the other thing, between, between Timmons' family coming down on me like, I did something wrong in this mess, 
between that and Paula coming out with her own, oh, I'm a Charleston socialite that grew Ron's empire. Choke on a fucking otter pot. I, every single thing I've had, I've had before I even met Paula. In fact, I'm worth less than when I, than before I met Paula because I quit working eight years ago when I met her, supported all of her BS hobbies from flying planes, catching clothes, uh, flipping houses. Dude, come on, please. I flipped 500 houses before I met her. I've had my, dude, I wouldn't even call it my empire. I wear t-shirt, shorts, and sandals. I do my own thing. I'm not trying to be on Bravo and Jerry Springer and fuck politicians in a bathroom that are fucking bald fucking small dick motherfuckers. Hope you choke on an otter pop. Didn't we have a video of me filleting an otter? Not an otter pop. It was a popsicle, right? We should do it like who did it better? Who did it better? Let's, we'll go, to, let's go back to him sucking the otter pop. Man, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, now let's go to mine. Where's mine? <laughs> I can't believe you pulled that clip, man. Anyway, for those of you who are listening on the podcast, we just did a side-by-side -side comparison of one man filleting an otter pop and another man, me, um, doing some gestures that probably you're glad you're not watching right now. You're only listening to. For those of you watching, I apologize. But um, this is where the scandal has gone. And it's crazy because when you think about it, we didn't want to write this. We didn't really want to go here. I mean, has it blown up? Is it blowing our traffic up? Yes. I'm not going to lie. I'll probably be able to put a pool in the house this summer, thanks to the William Timmons scandal. Thank you, by the way, Congressman. But these scandals, if, you, if you're familiar with South Carolina politics, we get them all the time. I mean, it's not really like, I don't know, it's almost like it's not even news anymore. I mean, has a sex scandal really been news since like Gary Hart? I mean, really, do we have to go back to Gary Hart? to find a time when people were like legitimately outraged. I think it's more entertainment. And the one thing I will say about Ron Rallis, who is the, uh, again, the, the we want to say there's a victim here, obviously Congressman Timmons' wife. She has not said anything about this. I would, I would probably classify her as somebody who's in a victim-type status here. But Ron Rallis, you know, your wife cheating on you with a congressman, I'd say you're somewhat of a victim here. But Two totally different responses. You got the congressman's wife, who's just absolutely off the off the grid, quiet, not saying anything, maybe silently plotting her revenge, maybe looking for someone to uh, tenderize the husband's testicles in the future. I don't know. Um, I don't know where my testicles are. My wife keeps them in an undisclosed location so that I don't get into shenanigans like this. But and then you've got Rallis, who's just, again, completely off the chain, completely unhinged, untethered. Although, if you bring an otter pop as a prop to your social media video, maybe there's some planning there. I don't know. But So we've talked about the scandal. We talked about how it started, <laughs> what it's turned into, which is reality TV, the likes of which I don't think Bravo can hold a candle to. Uh, let's talk about where it's going, and let's talk about the political ramifications. Uh, I know everyone's yawning. Let's get back to the otter pop sucking. No, we have to talk about the political out, uh, consequences here. Timmons has already won his primary election. Okay, He is the Republican nominee for the 4th Congressional District in the 2022 election. And if you know anything about South Carolina politics, where Republicans run the state, okay, he's going to win, right? I mean, this is not the sort of thing that's going to kill his candidacy. But... The sharks are circling, folks. The sharks are circling. There's some folks who are loyal to John Warren, an upstate businessman, ran for governor back in 2018, crushed it in Greenville County, has a ton of name ID up there, a ton of money, a ton of corporate backers, a ton of political donors. If John Warren starts making noise, and his people are making noise, but if he starts making noise on this, watch out William Timmons. Now, he's been a supporter of Timmons in the past, but there's an opening here for John Warren. And let's not forget... John Warren wants to be governor, people, and one of the last best governors of South Carolina, Republican governors, Carol Campbell, where did he reach the governor's office from? You got it, from the 4th Congressional District. So this is a great stepping stone for him. Also, let's not forget Mark Sanford was a congressman uh, from the 1st Congressional District before he became governor. So it's a great stepping stone for John Warren in the event he were to decide to do it. Now, we're going to keep an eye on that, but in the meantime, William Timmons' political consequences for this, not much, although we are told 
there are rumors of a potential write-in campaign in the fall. Will that impact Timmons with so many voters in South Carolina voting straight ticket Republican? We'll have to see, but it's definitely something that we're going to follow as we continue to track this crazy affair, political sex scandal out of out of uh, the South Carolina upstate. So stay tuned to Fist News for much more on the Timmons saga. We'll keep you posted on all the latest developments. All right, so I'm a huge fan of Agatha Christie and particularly of her famed fictitious detective Hercules Porridge, except that's not his name. It's Ecu Poirot. That's right. That's my French coming in handy, right? Except he's Belgium. Belgium. But Poirot was Agatha Christie's most famous character, appeared in over 30 of her novels, uh, and is generally regarded as, again, one of the most famous fictitious detectives next to Sherlock Holmes. In fact, Poirot is the only person, fictitious person, to have a New York Times obituary. Look it up. Look it up. Anyway, Poirot solved crimes the old-fashioned way, deductive, you know, called it his little gray cells, the brain matter, used his mind. These days... We're pulling tech records. We're subpoenaing Google. We are pulling CCTV, right? It's a different game. But there's a precision to these digital methods that makes it a little harder for criminals to get away with some of the chicanery that they used to get away with in decades past. So in covering the Murdoch murders, this news outlet has exclusively reported on a wide range of uh, incriminating evidence that is said to link Alec Murdoch, the attorney at the heart of this saga, to the murders of his wife and youngest son. So let's review those just real quickly. We talked about the high-velocity impact spatter. Now, this is fluid particulate matter. We don't know exactly know what it is, but we know that it is located on one of the articles of clothing that he was allegedly wearing and that it ties him directly to that crime scene, the Mazelle Hunting Lodge, at the time, at least one of those victims was murdered. Now, does that mean he did it? No, no. But it does mean he was there at the time they died, which is something that he has consistently said he wasn't, and something his lawyers have consistently said was not true. Remember, they told us he had an ironclad alibi, that he was nowhere near, that he was fully cooperating with law enforcement. And again, this was all 48 hours after the shooting when this news outlet was the first to identify him as a person of interest in connection with that homicide. So we got that physical evidence, but we've also got some video evidence. Some uh, was released about a month ago, and we reported again exclusively on that, which ties him, again, to a particular part of that property at a time when he, again, said he wasn't, said he was somewhere else, said he wasn't there. So, But there's a third layer of evidence that we're starting to get into now. We wrote a big story on it this week, and it's very important because I think as this story continues to advance, look ahead next week, people. I think this is going to play an even bigger role moving forward, and I'm talking about geofencing. I'm talking about geofence warrants in particular, and I'm talking about a debate over how they should be used, how they are being used, and if and how they're being used in the Murdoch murders case. Now, our researcher, Jen Wood, did an amazing video clip on this this week, working with Dylan Nolan, our director of special projects, just a deep dive into this subject, how it works on your phone, how it works on my phone. Uh, and I wanted to cut real quick to a clip of that before we get into how it particularly applies to the Murdoch murders. Let's cut real quick to that video by Jen Wood and Dylan Nolan. When a crime is committed, the goal of law enforcement officials is to find the perpetrator and gather evidence to help prosecutors build their case. As technology advances on our cell phones, investigators are increasingly using our location data to build their cases. The first type of data we're going to discuss is cell site location data, or CSLI. CSLI data is broken into two categories, historical and real time. I'm going to start with explaining historical CSLI data. So your cell phone operates by using radio frequencies. As you travel, your cell phone is constantly connecting to the nearest cell tower or towers using these radio frequencies. These cell tower connections are often referred to as an event or a ping by cellular providers, and they're maintained in call detail records that are timestamped. When law enforcement is investigating a crime and they have a clear suspect, they often obtain a search warrant to access this historical CSLI data on the suspect's phone. 
In fact, a landmark 2018 ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court stated that absent exigent circumstances, a search warrant supported by probable cause is required to obtain cellular location data for periods of at least seven days. Let's look at an example of how this data might be used in a criminal investigation. If investigators are trying to solve a murder of an individual and they have a suspect or person of interest, they could request a search warrant to obtain the historical CSLI data on the suspect's phone to help show they were at or near the crime scene at the time of the crime. But let's say it isn't that simple because the suspect lives at the same location as the victim. The historical CSLI data could be used to obtain a timeline of the suspect's movements to look for potential discrepancies in their statements to police. So, for example, a man murders his wife at their shared home, but states that the murder occurred after he left for work at 7 a.m. Law enforcement officials could consider requesting the historical CSLI data via a search warrant to verify that statement. A recent high-profile national case that has utilized historical CSLI data is the Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell case. Lori's two children, Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow, disappeared, and despite their mother's claims that the children were safe, as time went on, it became clear that this was not the case. The FBI's Cellular Analysis Survey team was brought in to assist investigators. Using historical CSLI data obtained from the phone of Lori Vallow's brother, investigators were able to locate the bodies of the two children. All right, so I want to back it up to the late 18th century, all right, to the founding of this country, to the foundational liberties that our framers envisioned when they were writing the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. And I want to talk about that Fourth Amendment, the protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, obviously, the founding fathers, unless they were doing some really good George Washington, Thomas Jefferson weed, <laughs> They couldn't have envisioned a world in which satellites, dozens of satellites, are circling the globe, providing pinpoint locations to literally hundreds of millions of electronic devices and other objects. They, they couldn't have imagined that. But they did foresee technology expanding. And as it expanded, they foresaw the need to protect citizens from, again, unreasonable searches and seizures. They wanted people to be safe in their property, in their homes, in their cone of privacy, if you will. And the courts, in recent years, as it relates to the issue of geofencing, of these cell tower dumps, of all these different reverse location lookups and historical cell phone data, the courts have taken care to point out that, yes, even though this information is being collected by these incredibly powerful private companies, uh, which can literally target you when you walk in a store and tell you what kind of shoe you want to buy, uh, they have recognized that there are privacy considerations here that you know, law enforcement can't just grab all this information. Uh, they have to actually have, and I'm going to use this term, I'm going to try to say it correctly. It's a very difficult little thing to say, but particularized probable cause. I'm going to say that again and try to not mess it up again. Particularized probable cause. And what that means is that it can't just be a hunch. It can't just be, oh, well, we think this person was there. They've got to have something else that puts them at that scene or or would reasonably believe lead someone to believe that somebody was at that scene. But if you get that, you can get a judge to sign a warrant and you can pull this information. And what does it do? Well, as Jen, Jen Wood and Dylan Nolan explained in that video, it allows you to pinpoint who was where. And as Jen Wood was saying, uh, the police start with a the date, they start with a time. And if your phone was there, hey, you got some explaining to do, am I right? I mean, dudes... Ladies, anybody down with OPP, you better not be getting geofenced right now. That's all I'm going to say. But as this Murdoch case moves forward, I want us to be very focused on, on this geofencing issue and the case law surrounding geofencing warrants because I believe it's going to be very important. And frankly, I believe it's going to be very important in the not-too-distant future. So as we continue to follow the Murdoch murders, crime, and corruption saga once again, Count on this news outlet to not only provide you with the latest breaking news, but more importantly, to go deep into the issues that are underlying this case and provide you with that background information so you're more informed about exactly what you're reading and seeing. All right, so in our last segment today, I want to talk about this microphone right here. And frankly, we got a bunch of microphones in here. We got How many microphones we got in here, Dylan? Like, there's an ass of microphones. There's another one. There's like another one over there. There's one over there. 
Usually I've got one like clipped to me too. Like we've got tons of microphones. But what I love about these microphones is that, yes, I paid for them, like a la Reagan or whatever, but they don't really belong to me, okay? Because as I've been saying for a long time, they belong to a bigger conversation. I'm part of it. The people that come sit in the chair opposite me in the studio, they're part of it. Uh, the people that we write about that submit responses, they're part of it. Um, but anyway, before I get into that, I want, I want to dip hand in the mailbag. We got a nice letter, and I love to come on the show and do like the nasty grams. I think it's fun. I like. I don't know. I maybe I'm a little damaged or something, but I love the like negative feedback. I kind of feed off it and thrive on it. But the problem with that is sometimes you don't always take enough time to appreciate the good feedback. So I, I, I want to read this letter real quick. Uh, regarding the open microphone policy at Fitz News. And this is from uh, Jay Monday. She's out of Alabama. And, uh, you know, readers in Alabama, that's awesome. But um, here's what she had to say. It is refreshing to read news that doesn't pander to one ideology or political party. I consider myself to be pretty right of center and a Trumplican. That's a cool, i never heard of that. Uh, I even have some libertarian leanings on some issues. That means I don't always agree with every article by Fitz News, but that's okay. I need to hear other points of view, just not all in one direction or the other. I love that line. I need to hear other points of view. Now, Prelo Alexander has been dropping some wild points of view. I mean, he is, as I, I noted in a column, if the, uh, I think I said, if the Overton window is like veering to the left like a shiny Aston Martin, right? Prelo is the traffic boot. He is the sparks flying on the pavement and scarring up the road driving that debate kind of back to the the middle. But he's not the only voice on this news outlet that we're going to be featuring in the weeks to come. And if you missed it this week, we did a big teaser article. It was the article I spent the most time working on this week that I was the most invested in of anything that was published on Fitz News this week. And it was an article about a new guest columnist that we're going to be rolling out next week. Now, this columnist, a lot of you have already – oh, yeah, there's the picture. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to stop for a minute here. Yeah. If you're, if you're not able to see this on the podcast, you need to log on to the article <laughs> because, yeah. But I'm excited about this voice, not because obviously we've got some beauty in, involved here, but I'm excited about this voice because it is compelling, because there are ideas that are not my own. In fact, that are diametrically opposed in many cases to my own, but they're being expressed intelligently. And like... Our letter writer, Ms. Monday from Alabama, said, I need to hear other points of view, too. Because we're in a media environment right now, people, where people, they just want to be coddled. They want to be affirmed. They want to hear, you know, their tribe's view on everything. And they don't care what the actual facts are. Okay, they don't care who actually did wrong or who did right. They just want to know what team they're on, right? You know, we talked earlier about a big sex scandal in South Carolina that we covered involving the Republican Congressman William Timmons. And there's so many people, they're going to view that story. They're going to view all these other stories through the lens of, okay, what team are they on? You know, are they a Republican or are they Democrat? Are they white or are they black? Are they from gay or are they straight? Are they from, and Timmons, by the way, I don't know. We're hearing maybe both. I don't know. But everybody looks through these things through different lenses, okay? And my point is don't. My point is don't. My point is, use your mind, okay? You've been given a brain. You've been given the capacity for independent thought. Use that. Use that. And that's the conversation that we are going to be all about here at Fitz News. And that's going to mean me putting forward ideas I don't necessarily disagree with. But anyway, I'm very excited when we're going to roll out this new column next week. First column should come early next week from our guest columnist. Watch out for her because I think she's going to shake things up on Fitz News in a big way. But more importantly... This mic, always on, always open. The floor at Fitz News is always yours. So anytime you've got something you want to weigh in on, please let us know whether it's critical, whether it's complimentary, whether it's harsh. We want to hear it because, again, that helps us do our job better. And if we do our job better, then we're all moving the ball forward uh, for a more transparent, more accountable state. So anyway, that's all I got on that. Look forward to introducing the new comments next week. But I want to thank everybody once again for tuning into the Weekend Review. I'm so glad to be back, shaking the rust off a little bit after two weeks of vacation, chasing my seven crackhead kids up and down the eastern seaboard. By the way, 
lotioning up seven kids to go out on the beach. Thankfully, I didn't have to lotion up all of them, but and then freaking chasing them all over the beach and then showering these little urchins after they get off the beach. Dude, it is crazy. So I have a newfound respect for my wife and the way she rolls. But again, glad to be back. Glad to be uh, back in the seat here in the studio. Oh, and one last thing before we go, Dylan sh- flashing the phone to me with a little uh, mug shot that I need to remind you about next week. We know it's going to be, be a big week on, on one front, right? Or so we've been led to believe, so we've been told. But it, next week could have some other big news, and I'm talking about the Bowen Turner case. Uh, Fitz News will be traveling to Orangeburg, South Carolina, for a court hearing on the parole revocation of Bowen Turner. And again, he's the teenager from Orangeburg, South Carolina, who's been uh, accused of not one, not two, but three sexual assaults. He got a sweetheart plea deal, which kind of exposed the corrupt judicial system in South Carolina. We will be traveling to Orangeburg, South Carolina this week for his parole revocation hearing. So look forward to a big story on that. And also Dylan Nolan and I are continuing to put the finishing touches on a big documentary related to Bowen Turner. Hope to have that out within the next week or two, but it's going to dive even deeper into that story and the bigger story of judicial corruption in the Palmetto State. So look forward to that. Thanks again to everybody for tuning in. That's it for this edition of Your Week in Review.